Thanks for joining me today, Dick. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And we're going to talk a little bit about your, your new book. Okay, super. And what's it called? Uh, Dead Man Walking. Uh, it's uh, a Solid One Zero's personal journal. So it's, it's about what I saw, you know, from getting to SOG and starting to run SOG missions and running them and what I learned uh, across time. So, you know, I tried to learn more every time I went out and uh, doing after action reviews, you know, with the team, doing post mission training, getting us ready for the next one. So, tried to make it a learning experience. And I think you can see that uh, as you go through the book. Changed the equipment I carried, how I carried it, how the team carried it, different things based on uh, what I was learning, you know, from the missions. Yeah, and, and I've had the, the, the joy of having an early sight of it and really enjoyed what I've read so far. It's, uh, you know, it's up there with WTF and Across the Fence and We Few in terms of uh, being a classic SOG uh, memoir. Uh, but you go a little bit deeper into the sort of analysis of missions, and um, and I think I think people will find you know it's quite a unique and interesting take on the on the SOG experience. Um, in the book, you you, um, you 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 write in there in the combat, and I mean that comes out right from page one, and uh, and I think people of a certain in, with a certain interest in military history and in in. In war stories, you know, are going to enjoy it, and uh, you know, for our, for our audience, I guess uh, today, if we focus a little on the on the weapons, because we're going to do a, a number of these recordings. Um, so, <clears throat> let's start with you um, and your your CCN in SOG in Vietnam, and you're assembling your personal weapons for battle. So. So can you tell me a little bit uh, how that came about? Did you get advice from other team members, from other one zeros, from the armorer? Where, where did you get your? Yeah, uh, when I <clears throat> I originally went to FOB one at at Fubai, and that's where I was put on uh, RT Alabama as the one one, and the one zero there said uh, go to S four draw the equipment, here are the things I want you to get. Um, and so he had designated me to to carry a car 15. You know, so I went over, and that's what they issued me, um, SOG knife, different things like that. So I set up the equipment the way their team SOP was, and you know started learning from there. Um, but was, car 15, became my um, you know, personal weapon that I used the majority of the time. There were some missions later on where you know, I carried an AK-47. I actually carried an M60 machine gun one time and learned quickly that was not a good idea for me to carry for various reasons, but I went back to the Car 15, and then you know sometimes I would carry a sawed-off uh, M79. Um, I carried there were a couple of different uh, pistols that I carried, but most of the time the pistol was uh, um, you know the 22 caliber with an integrated silencer on it. Mm -hmm. Did you get issued a, a high power with the one with the, the silencer? Oh, you're talking about the nine millimeter? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I took one off of, of uh, NVA that I shot one time, and I, I carried that out uh, on a mission or two, but I decided that should be more of a war trophy, so I didn't want to lose it. Mm -hmm. Anything you had with you on a mission, you're subject to lose. So. And, and did, is, it, is it right that one time you, um, you did you carry a suppressed stent, or did you just you train with one? Or something? We, we did some training, Lynn Black and I, I uh, did some work on uh, ambushes and, and, you know, we ran some ambushes in, uh, inside Vietnam to test out some different weapon systems and different tactics and um, 
there were a couple of times on those that we uh, used stem guns. You know, I mean, it was, I mean, it sounded like a sewing machine. You could just hear the bolt going back and forth, but the thing was so suppressed. Mm -hmm. And that was, was pretty cool. And so, and, and you were doing ambushes on what, VC in, yeah. in Vietnam? Right. Yeah, okay. And that was just your practice mission? Yeah, it was just to practice and, you know, how do we set up and um, can we take them out in a silenced mode, you know, just using silenced weapons um, so nobody else heard what we were doing. And then we said, well, if we, if we can do it with a nine millimeter, can we do it with a 22? So we set up an ambush and we just used the 22s and you just have to shoot them more times, but you can do that. And, uh, you know, that worked out. And, you know, we were testing different techniques and then we would share those, you know, with other operators. Here's, here's what we've been doing, what we learned. So, um, you mentioned the suppressed, like the high standard, or is that what it was, the 2.2? Two -two? Mm -hmm. and, and how did you use that? Uh, I just used it a, uh, a couple occasions where, um, you know, my magazine was empty and the guys were coming over the rock, you know, so I pulled the pistol out and used the pistol to shoot them. Um, used it in uh, prisoner snatches to try to, you know, shoot a potential prisoner in the in the leg and what we found was that if I shoot you in the thigh with a 22 I mean it stings it hurts enough to cause you to you know let your weapon down and grab your leg well when you do that now I've got a chance to you know go in and pop you take you down give you the syrup and see if I can get out with you so uh, we do it like that. I took out uh, dogs that were tracking us. Um, and a few occasions I took out trackers who were tracking us. I just dropped back from the team. And as they, the trackers would come up, you know, they were not expecting me to be there. And, you know, you get a, a head shot. You usually put them right down the first time. If it, if it hit the body, it might take three or four times. but. Then you could go up and check and make sure they were uh, terminated, so and see what kind of documents or whatever they had on. Right, and and I I think from your book, it's evident that not many of your attempted prisoner snatches worked out. Is that right? Yeah, I I think I I've, I've tried to share that I got a lot of prisoners. They just tended to be dead, so they don't count as prisoners. Uh, you know, we interrogated them to the degree that we could, get documents off of them. But one one problem that we were running into was their comrades really didn't want them to be prisoners. So they were, you know, just fierce in terms of attacking and trying to kill their own people to make sure you didn't take them out. Plus the people, you know, the prisoners, um, had been told all these tales about what we were going to do with them, torture them and all that, they would kill themselves to keep from going with us. And, you know, in one case, occasion we had you know, a prisoner that actually dove out of a helicopter, blindfolded, handcuffed, you know, 2,600 feet head first. So, I guess you changed the SOP at that point to, yeah. to make sure he's, 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 yeah. he's tethered to the, one of the dealings. He was somewhere. supposed to have been tethered, but right. somehow he got yeah. loose from that. And I don't, it's in, interesting that, you know, I mean, he, he couldn't see anything. He knew he was in a helicopter. He could feel the wind, so he knew where the openings were. And once he got, got loose, he dove out. That takes some courage. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we we did grab a lot of people. We just didn't always uh, get them back alive. And the one guy that we did get back alive uh, was wounded, you know, by his people. Uh, and he died on the operating table when we got back to the hospital. And did, did you get your R&R &R for that or not? Because no. No, no, no intelligence value. They, they wanted them no. alive and... Mm. Yeah, I didn't have a lot of success with R&R. &R. 
So the, the book talks about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you mentioned the Sawn-Off M79, and how did you come to get hold of one of those? Uh, when I was on RT Michigan as a 1-0 at FOP4, um, Bargewa had one that he played with, and I liked it, and I thought, well, you know, sometimes I might want to have one of those, a little extra firepower for the mission that we're going on. Um, so, I mean, a lot of people had them, so it was easy to, to get them. And one, one thing was when, like when, when I left you know, Vietnam, I mean, when I was leaving SOG, I had all kinds of weapons. You know, so I just gave them out to my buddies. If anybody wanted, you want an AK? Okay, here's an AK. You want a sawed off M79? Here, take this one. You know, so people tended to give their weapons to, you know, other operators, other friends that they had there. So. Mm -hmm. And and how, how did you? When, when did you choose to pull that th that sucker out and use it? You know, if if they were assaulting us, uh, and you you needed more. Uh, area uh, type weapons to slow them down. You know, we always, I always had at least one person uh, as a as an M79 guy on the team, sometimes two, but if I had the sawed off one, uh, that gave us more, particularly if I was with a small team. Most of the time I would take six or seven people, you know, as a whole team. So if I could have that sawed off one that I was carrying, kind of tucked out of the way. That gave us a second one if we needed it. Mm -hmm. So just kind of depended on the mission and how hot the area was and how much contact we were expecting to have. I've, I've heard some SOG guys talk about how they would um, preload the sawn off with a, with a buckshot round and then switch to HE afterwards. Yeah, I just, I like the HE for me, for what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, buckshot's nice, but you know, it's kind of short range. Uh, if they're up really close to you, then you know, it's more like a pistol. If you're shooting the HE round, it, and you gotta go a lot further to, to give it time to arm before it hits. Or if the guy's close, then you hit him with it, it, it can actually penetrate um, and not go off. But you know, if you got 40 rounds, slug in your stomach, um, that slows you down a little bit. It'll knock you down if it hits you, mm -hmm. even if it doesn't explode, so. Right, so you've got the firepower from the M79s, you've got your your smaller caliber, like like your suppressed pistols for, for your prisoners. What, what What's your sort of main fighting weapon? I guess that's your CAR-15. Yeah, CAR-15, mm -hmm. and I tended to, even though I was a one zero, I, I tended to shoot a lot um, it just kind of irritated me sometimes when they would start shooting at me, so I'd shoot back. Um, I still had to kind of orchestrate what was going on, but I also uh, shot a lot. And I don't, I don't know of anyone else that carried 50 magazines, um, but you know, with the 20 round magazines, I, I carried 50, um, and you know, I I shot a lot. But I didn't always use them all, but I might, you know, you're running out, I might toss you three or four magazines, I might toss one of the other guys some magazines so I could I could share those extra ones that I had, you know, if other guys were running out. Um, but you know, I, I like the CAR-15, um, and depending on, on the vegetation and the distance and <clears throat> the condition of, of the NBA I was engaging, I would change the shot pattern, you know, going from, you know, semi to double taps to three round bursts, occasionally fully automatic, you know, put the whole magazine out there. But I kind of adjusted it. Uh, if, if it appeared that the NBA were on drugs and hyped up on drugs, three round burst was more effective than three single shots. And part of the reason for that is if you think about shooting one of them in the chest, uh, it's kind of like taking a baseball bat and taking a full swing at the person and hitting him as hard as you can in the chest from the impact of the bullet. 
uh, if I shoot you with a double tap or a triple tap, it's like, you know, I, I hit you in the chest, I draw back, I hit you again, I draw back and I hit you again. So there's an interval in between the impacts. If I fire on automatic and put three rounds in your chest, it's almost like they, they hit you at the same time. So it's like getting hit with three baseball bats all at one time. And even on drugs, you're going down if I hit you with three of them like that. So, mm -hmm. and and there are you know other occasions where you know two rounds might be enough, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times with the thickness of the vegetation, I'm shooting at the movement, I'm shooting at a muzzle flash, or or the, or the sound. So if I put a three round burst in there, I've got a better chance of hitting you than if I just shoot one time because you're probably shooting and moving. And if I put three, I can cover a little wider area. Yeah. I guess one of the rounds might hit an AK vest or something. It could. Yeah. yeah. So you, and you, uh, you know, my uh, on Michigan, my one one was you know Eldon Bargewell, who became uh, legendary. But he was hit. Uh, he had picked up an NVA vest and put it on, and he was was hit in the chest. And it stopped him. One of them penetrated a little bit and made him bleed some. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was steel magazines that the AKs had at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, if they had ammunition in there, uh, it could stop a bullet. So, so I know that with SOG um, LBE, you've got you know you would put your um, twenty round mags in in your um, canteen pouches, for example, right. five or even seven in a pouch um, with your quick pull cord or tape on, on them. How would you set up for an AK if you're carrying an AK? Uh, with a vest, usually, and, and I'd have more in the, in my rucksack. Right. But, you know, if, if I was carrying an AK, I was trying to look like, you know, a North Vietnamese, so i wear their gear mm -hmm. and set up like them. And, and the other thing you begin to realize is when you put on the vest and start uh, loading up with, you know, with the AK is they were not carrying the, the number of magazines that we were. They had a lot less ammunition on them, mm -hmm. so they were going to run out quicker. They also liked to fire on automatic. And then on the AK, the first, the first setting is a full auto. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so they could, they would run out quickly. So I put a lot more magazines in my rug, but they were heavy. Mm -hmm. You know, because they were steel and they were 30 rounds. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you, I've, we were talking the other day about um, their weapons, the MVA's weapons, and I was asking about SKS and other things. You were saying generally you only saw AKs. For the most part. And then sometimes, you know, a tracker might have an SKS or something, but right. um, most of the, you know, the, the Army real guys that were coming at you, you know, had AKs that my experience, I mean, other people, um, you know, saw a lot of different weapons. And you, and you trained your team on using the AK on the range? Yeah, well, we trained on all of them on the range because, um, you know, if you run out of ammunition, you need to be able to pick up whatever's there, whether it's a, you know, RPD machine gun or AK or um, RPG, whatever's there, you need to to know how to uh, operate it and use it so that you can use their ammunition. Right, and and I think I remember you saying about listening to the sounds of the enemy when they're shooting. So you've got, it's a pretty deafening <coughs> noise you were saying, but you're, you're also picking out in that where the RPD is. Yeah, it's, uh, an AK is, AK-47 has a very distinct sound uh, and different from a CAR-15, so you can tell if it's someone shooting a CAR-15 or shooting an AK, really, I mean, it doesn't take you long at all to, to recognize the difference. The RPD is very different than the AK. It's shooting faster, it just sounds different. Mm -hmm. um, so when the AKs are firing at you, and you, so you're saying, how, how many am I hearing? You know, what size is this force that we've gone up against? Is it getting larger? Is it moving? Are they starting to try to get around us? Uh, and when an RPG starts up, then you say, oh, 
this is a larger force. They don't send two or three guys out with an RPG, mm-hmm. you know. So now we 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 may have a platoon size element that we're up against, and I hear that RPG. So where is it? Um, does it move in mm-hmm. terms of the sound that I'm hearing? Do I hear another one? And the group's getting larger now. Um, and my philosophy was and belief was that, you know, if you're not moving uh, during contact, you're dying. If I stop right here um, and let you pin us down, you will immediately start to go around us and try to encircle us, mm-hmm. so we can't get away. So you got to you got to either move toward them or you got to start to get away from them. And and listening to them kind of gives you some insight as to where they are. And sometimes they're going to try to push you in a particular direction, so they know you're listening. And if all of a sudden they're shooting at you from over, you know, on, on the left flank, you're probably going to initially think, I, I need to go to the right. So they've left that open for you because they, they've sent somebody down there to get you when you get there. Mm-hmm. Or they may be trying to push you away from an LZ because they, they know they're only clearing in the area that you can get extracted from, you know, like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, so you're behind enemy lines here. You're, you're, you're you know, you're up against overwhelming forces. This is where your claymores come in. Yes. Um, probably might be my favorite weapon. All the toe poppers are, you know, up high on the list too. But with the claymores, uh, you can get their attention uh, even when they're assaulting you. Uh, but every time we would stop, go into an RON position for the night, uh, we would put out claymores, and I like to daisy chain them. So if you put seven claymores out on the most likely avenue of approach into where where you are, when you set that off, that's ten and a half pounds of C4 with that blast wave going at them. So even if nothing else. That's that's a tremendous blast wave, but inside that blast wave, uh, you know, you got 3,500 steel balls at 4,000 feet a second coming at you, uh, and it's going to shred anything that's there. So the blast is going to knock people down, the balls are going to shred people, and the survivors see that and say, wow, you know, I've had a claymore fired at me before, but not that many. Mm -hmm. And then as we were be moving away, I'd leave another three daisy chain and they hit that and that's still a powerful explosion. It's gonna take more people out. Now they're beginning to think, this guy's crazy. And he seems to have a lot of claymores. <laughs> but then you leave some individuals with time fuses behind, you know, so randomly you got these things going off and even if they don't hit anyone, you know one went off over there. You could have been right over there mm-hmm. and, and gotten taken out. So you don't know how many more are set out. So, and again, because it was one of my favorite weapons, um, I had my guys carry three a piece for the most part. So if I took a seven man team out, I had 21 claymores. So I could, I could put seven out there to get your attention with, and I still got plenty more. And then I, you know, I combine those with frag grenades. Um, most teams, team members carried uh, five frags. I had my guys carry ten. Mm-hmm. You know, it was kind of a shock to their system. You know, when I would come in and take over and say, "We're going to carry more claymores. We're going to carry more frag grenades. You guys are going to carry more magazines." Um, mm-hmm. But the firepower that gave us, you know, was tremendous. And, and I guess that's partly you, you coming in as a, as a trained ranger officer compared to some guys arriving at the CCN who are more green. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'd learned a, you know, a lot from, from the rangers, from the ranger training um, that just fit right into what SOG teams are doing. The planning, the execution, uh, positioning of equipment, how you wore it, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then getting in, I, I guess, uh, what about Willie Pete? Did you use that for breaking contact or mainly yes. for marking for air support? Um, mostly breaking contact. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I like to 
you know, put one of those in front of Claymore too. Because then you've got the steel balls coming, but you also have, uh, you know, the white phosphorus coming at you and creating that dense smoke, which would kill you. Uh, it's very, it just eat your lungs up if you inhaled it. Mm -hmm. so, it so it gave you some concealment to help move away as well as, um, you know, taking out a lot of the bad guys. I can't think of many soldiers in the world that would want to come up against a team like yours. Um, what does it tell you about the courage of the North Vietnamese Army? Well, at, at the time, at that time period, North Vietnamese Army was, was probably like the number four army in the world in terms of their abilities to come at you. These were, were not farmers, they were not Viet Cong. These were the hardcore trained um, North Vietnamese soldiers and they were part of the group, the 50,000 or so that was sent to try to get us anyway, sog hunters. <clears throat> and you know, they got all kind of recognition and rewards and things if they were to kill one of us. Um, and they were, you know, motivated to come get us they were very highly trained, so, yeah. You, you, met, you mentioned the toe poppers, so, so they, how would you use those? Uh, I had spent a lot of time, you know, when I was growing up, uh, tracking animals, following animals, following people uh, through wooded areas and, and places. You know, my, one of my goals was to be able to track an ant through a cornfield. I never quite reached that skill level, you know, but I was working on it. So uh, one of the, the things that gave me was if I'm tracking an animal or tracking a person, their, their behaviors uh, that they exhibit uh, that are an advantage to me if I want to take them out. Uh, if you come to a log, almost without exception, everyone, We'll just step over to the other side of the log, and keep going. You know, a little log, whatever. I know that's where you're going to step. You're following our trail because you're trying to track us. I know when you get to that log, you're going to step on the other side of it. So if I put one or two toe poppers on the other side, one of them's going to get you, and it's going to shatter everything up to about your knee level. Probably take your foot off if you step on it right. And there's no hospital, emergency room, anything for you to go to. You don't bleed to death. So, you know, I, uh, I'm going to take you. I got really good at doing that. So if I thought you were tracking us, uh, and I was willing to let you know we were really there, I'd put the toe popper out to take your, uh, your tracker out. Um, when we would move into an RON, I would have uh, toe poppers out on the trail. Um, so that you couldn't slip up on us. Mm -hmm. you know, somebody would step on it, and I found most of the time, you know, when the tractor stepped on the toe popper, there was this automatic assumption that we were out in front of them, and they would all start shooting that way. And we would actually be off to the side and, and behind them a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that gave us, you know, that little temporary period of time to decide if we were going to, you know, stay and engage them with aerial weapons when they come, or, you know, what we were going to do. Right, so you're, you're using the psychology all the time in the way you're deploying your, your arsenal. Yeah, I, I began to learn, you know, fairly quickly that, <coughs> that North Vietnamese were not animals, they were humans, and humans behave in certain ways, and as I watched them, I, I could see their behaviors, how they reacted to us when we made contact, how they reacted to the air support and different things like that. So uh, I tried to learn more and more and then use that psychology against them or to help us be more effective and trained our guys that way. You know, I, I just call it the human reaction to combat at the time and said, here are things that people do, mm -hmm. whether it's us or, or the NVA. These are things people do when they start getting shot at or get scared. Um, so let's use that to our advantage. So, so um, I think the one weapon we haven't touched on is is uh, bladed weapons. So, what what did you carry? How did you use it? 
Um, I, I tried several different ones. I tried the SOG knife, and, and you know, it was nice. It was easy to maneuver. Uh, if you wanted to stick somebody with it, you, you could. Um, but I ended up going with the K-bar. The K-bar was longer. It gave me a longer reach to go after something. And when you put a K-bar blade into somebody, you know, they know it. There's no doubt in their mind they've been stabbed. And depending on which way you take it out, you can do some significant damage. If you put it into the neck, I mean, you're going to get the juggler and the carotid and, you know, it's over and, you know, a few seconds they're starting to pass out. Uh, if you put it in and shoot your hand forward, you take out everything in the front. Um, so I, I like that, but the K-Bar also uh, had a big enough blade and heavy enough that if you needed to chop down some little poles or some bamboo, mm -hmm. you could do that. So. And, and did you, did you get the feeling when you have to pull that knife that it might be all over because you're you know you're that close and yeah it's it's different when you're when you're going to be that close to the other guy um, you know kind of runs your heart rate up a little bit so, wow it's going to be interesting um, but having the bigger knife and even if you you know, you get into the hand-to-hand -hand with them and you do some hacking and whacking and stuff like that. I mean, they start they start to back off or you injure them and they drop whatever they have, which again gives you an advantage. And uh, you know, so I, I really like the K-Bar for what we were doing. I guess um, beyond this, you've got the, the massive air support and we're going to get, that in, get into that in another session, but that would be the you know, the force multiplier that you're bringing to bear. But oh, yeah. You, you I mean, we're... People have asked me, you know, over the years, I mean, how could you go against uh, a North Vietnamese battalion? There's six of you. How could you do that? I said, because we moved very quietly and carried a really big stick, being the air power mm -hmm. that was back behind us. And, you know, once we made contact, uh, you bring that air pair power to bear on the enemy uh, and you could crush a major force with it. Well, I think um, we'll, we're going to do that in another session and uh, I think this has been a fascinating insight into the, the weapons of SOG and the, the, the mindset required to sort of deploy them effectively in a, in a situation where you're facing overwhelming numbers and you know that was that was fantastic thanks thanks so much yeah, thank you